The real estate agent was sympathetic towards my situation. The house was way out of my price range and there was no way I could have afforded any of it. But she made a deal with me. To this day, I still can't believe it was genuine. But it was. But had I known the repercussions, I would have immediately declined. I would have taken homelessness over this. Anything. Anything over this. I thought the deal ridiculous when she first approached me with it. A joke. A gag like the ones you see on social media that say, You could stay if you have blank if you ever do or have blank again. Everyone takes those offers. They're hypothetical. And nothing could actually go wrong. So when she proposed that, I could stay in the house as long as I lived, rent free, mortgage free, tax free, as long as I gave up Hot Pockets. I thought she was joking. It was when she looked at me with those sympathetic honey brown eyes and touched my shoulder that I realized she wasn't. I asked her how, if that was even legal, trying to laugh it off and quell the excitement that threatened to bubble to the surface. I wouldn't be homeless. She assured me that I wouldn't have anything to worry about, that she was able to take care of everything through some real estate jargon loophole that I didn't really understand. She told me when I signed the deed of the house that she had a son just like me, who had also fallen on hard times and had to move back home. I had told her prior in the open house that I had no family in the area. I was in grad school and dorm life was starting to wane on my health and safety for personal reasons. I guess her mothering instinct just took over. I realized then and now how weird it was, but the prospects of losing everything I'd ever owned and living on the street was a source of great anxiety and stress and I was a desperate twenty-something with a bachelor's in biology who should have minored in common sense. I moved my stuff in the week after I signed the deed. Like every broke college student in the history of forever, I had eaten more than my fair share of Hot Pockets. They taste like soggy cardboard, melted plastic, and cap off at a temperature of a volcano. But they're cheap and you can get a lot of them and your food stamps go farther when you buy in bulk. The notion that I wouldn't have to pay for the place to house myself meant that I could purchase food that tasted infinitely better than a Hot Pocket. And so in that moment, I felt as though I had come out on top. That life was starting to look up for me. Life was pretty normal for a while. I had settled into a pleasant routine, set up my house how I wanted it, even had enough money left over from my separate savings accounts for the house to purchase some pretty wanky new additions to my one story home. I had curtains, nice curtains, and everything was going well. It wasn't until I started my last year of school that I began to notice it. Everyone in their life has had cravings before and I was no exception. There's a certain type of hunger to a craving that's incredibly hard to describe, however. It gnaws at you, like an itch just out of reach. It's more annoying than anything, but it's a constant reminder that you have an irrational need for the object in question. Sometimes it goes away after a while, but it's hard to put into words just how maddening it is to have a craving when you can't have the thing you crave. I sat in the cafe area when I first inhaled it. It was unlike anything I had ever smelled before. The perfect combination of spices with heavy notes of garlic, savory melted cheese, hearty cured gourmet Italian pepperoni, and, and the sauce with such a sweet robust tomato scent that my mouth began to water. I wondered who had brought the designer takeout when I looked toward the area in which I was coming for, and I saw it. There, next to the microwave, was a freshly heated up pepperoni pizza hot pocket. I scoffed when I saw it. There was no way that scent came from a hot pocket of all things. But as I got up to go investigate, sure enough, that delectable mouth-watering aroma was coming from that hot pocket. I don't think I ever hated a food more in that moment than I did then. It seems really stupid, I know, but when the agent had told me not to eat the hot pockets, she had said it with such certainty that I would never be able to live here again if I did. The correlation seems so similar to my favorite childhood movie, The Gremlins, that I had to agree to it. And honestly, for the security of my own home, I would have given up anything. 
Hot Pockets seemed like the least painful thing to give up. The cafe was a reoccurring incident. Someone, every time I was there, heated up a Hot Pocket to eat. Every time it smelled better than the last. I should mention that with the new acquisition of my house, my job, my savings and monetary amounts increased to the point where I could afford just about the nicest foods money could buy. I no longer needed food stamps and when I went out to eat with friends, I could always pay for someone else's dinner and mine. I could eat anything I wanted to, but in those moments, all I wanted were those hot pockets. I mentioned earlier, the craving sometimes goes away, but it all should be worth noting that the more you are exposed to the thing you crave, the stronger the cravings get. After a few months of the inconsistent hot pocket consumption in the cafe, I stopped going, but that didn't mean I still wasn't haunted by them. It seemed like every few days in my city, a new hot pocket advertisement billboard would surface. I'd be driving down the interstate, minding my own business when I'd see it. The blaring red and white sign with the incredibly photoshopped cheese laid in hot pocket on it. My stomach must have been conditioned by the cafe incidents because each time I saw that billboard, my stomach would growl as though I hadn't fed it that day. I eat pretty regularly, I'm by no means a big guy, but I have the means to pick up my next meal whenever I want. I have that luxury now, thanks to my new house. And seemingly, as I drove in the opposite direction back to my beautiful house, there was another billboard. It looked identical to the one that I had seen earlier, as though the sign had moved. It was a stupid notion to be sure, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it was too coincidental. I rationalized it in my head that I was hyper fixated on Hot Pockets since I couldn't have them anymore. That Hot Pockets were not out to get me and that I just haven't been sleeping enough and I'm too stressed out from my medical program. I pulled into my driveway. My stomach absolutely starved every day after passing those billboards. It was ridiculous. But I was home and I could make my own dinner or order out if I was feeling lazy. I would make my dinner, sit down, put on a movie, and just relax. I barely noticed it at first because I was too busy scarfing down my food to try and quell the pains in my stomach. But the more I ate, the less and less I was able to taste it. Each passing day, I'd add more and more spices, get creative with my dinners, order something new off a menu from a place I'd never been to before. But each time I ate it, all I could taste was bland, almost cardboard flavor. Nothing tasted good, and nothing smelled good. I stopped being able to sleep another month after that. My dreams were invaded by hot pockets and memories I had had with them. I'd wake up in a sweat, having dreamt about the first time I ever ate a hot pocket. I was 12 and my dad had just come home from work as my mom was leaving for her shift at the hospital. He opened the freezer and took out the box of Hot Pockets that he had hidden from her and told me that it would be our secret and we could do this as much as we wanted as long as we didn't tell her. My 12 year old self remembers them tasting so much better than my adult self remembered them. Maybe it was situational. Maybe Hot Pockets just tasted better when you weren't supposed to be having them. I don't know but I'd wake up in the middle of the night to my stomach burning as though I hadn't gone to bed with a full stomach before. Every night, I would dream about Hot Pockets, and every night, I'd wake up starving. Every night I would get less and less sleep, and eventually, I'd just stop trying to sleep. I'd study my books, my notes, anything to keep myself occupied enough to forget the ache in my gut or the heaviness of my eyelids. When I could no longer read the print of my papers, every third commercial was for Hot Pockets. I don't know why I just didn't go talk to someone. I don't know why I didn't make an appointment for some psychiatric treatment because I clearly was going insane. Each night for a week, every third commercial on every station was for Hot Pockets, and then the next week, every second commercial and the week after that, every commercial. I had stopped going to class, I had stopped sleeping, and I had stopped eating. I had stopped going to work. My boss called me that day that I hadn't shown up. My eyes were still glued to the TV screen, not only playing the Hot Pocket commercial on a continuous loop, but my phone rang. It was a welcoming relief from the static jingle of the television and I answered it nervously. 
I was expecting to hear my boss's shrill voice on the end of the line, berating me about how distracted I'd been lately and how she wasn't going to tolerate my lazy behavior anymore. But it never came. Instead, my phone played static with a soft and coherent melody in the background. And then the melody grew louder and louder. Hot Pocket. Hot Pocket. Hot Pocket. I threw my phone as far away from me as I could, gripping my hair and curling it on myself onto the hardwood floor. It was the real estate agent's fault. It had to have me. She was mocking me, tormenting me. She must have realized what an awful sale she'd made on the house. And there was no other explanation. I sobbed on the floor, holding my aching abdomen as craving tore through my body with my sobs. The garbled jingle from the TV and phone continued to play. I don't remember what time it was when I came to, but the sky was dark. There was only the glow from the TV, displaying the Hot Pocket logo. I sat up, my head pounding from dehydration, and I looked around for my phone to see what time it was. I had to crawl over to it. My body felt so heavy from starvation that I don't think I could have stood up to get it. As soon as I touched it, it rang again. Dreading the idea that it would play the jingle again, I answered it anyway. Once again, I heard the static and a garbled voice speaking to me. I couldn't understand what it was saying and I checked the number but I didn't recognize it. The garbled voice continued speaking. I begged, pleaded, sobbed to it, in hopes that it would reverse whatever curse I had brought upon myself. But then, the voice went silent, the TV went silent and the world had gone silent. I don't remember how I got to the real estate office, or how I busted down the door to the realtor's office, or how the place caught fire. The police asked all these questions, but I was too shy to remember how any of it had happened. They took me to a hospital that night, straight to the psych department where I met with several social workers and doctors. I could see the look in their eyes when I told them about my Hot Pocket conspiracy. How I'd somehow sold my sanity for a house and I can never eat Hot Pockets again. They admitted me and the doctor who gave me the paperwork to sign for consent of treatment had the warmest, honey brown eyes.